Okay, this is the fourth um, session on socialism. It's a little video recap of the Google Meet session that I did earlier on today. Uh, and this one's about the state. So you remember all of these ideas, state, human nature, society, and the economy are all about things which almost all socialists agree on before we start looking at ways in which there are differences between them. So in a 24 mark question, this is the sort of thing that goes into the first paragraph. So evaluate the extent to which socialists disagree about the, about the state. This is the kind of thing we use here. Okay. And in, in, these are all the things they agree on. Okay. Um, let's start as we often do with these ones by thinking about the way in which, uh, we already currently think about the state or people who are not socialists think about the state and capitalism in particular really wants to have it both ways. I'm going to argue here, and this is especially the case for liberals, but to some extent for conservatives too, because on the one hand, they want the state to be relatively small. They don't think that it's the business of the state to interfere in your private work or in whether you own private property or what you do with that property. And therefore that extends to taxation. And so government should be relatively small. It should be limited and we should let people keep the money that they've earned in their own pockets or keep the money that's come from their business in their own pockets. As such, since we're going to have low taxes, then we're also going to have pub low public spending. But there's an ideological reason for that as well. It's that the government shouldn't be the thing which provides something for everybody. People should provide things for themselves. And that's what makes for better citizens. And the, the government's authority, its reach in terms of what it can make people do should also be limited to the extent that both liberals and conservatives, you remember, are both kind of trade offs about, OK, you keep order and we'll uh, let you be in charge. So there's a social contract. And, and the idea is that, you know, it is supposed to be a contract. So government can't just do what it wants. But on the other hand, we want a strong state to, de to protect the property of the people who are in charge, people who, who are wealthy. And that means that we're going to have uh, an extensive uh, arrangement of police and prisons, and criminal law and all sorts of other things so that the state's tentacles do branch out quite a lot where it comes to the business of protecting wealth and property. And the state also ensures that there's going to be order by stopping uh, unruly protest and by uh, limiting to some extent the ability of the media to uh, to criticise it. So what we've got is a free economy and strong state. We've talked about Thatcher in those, in those terms as well, even though we, we often talk about her as a, a free market uh, 19th century liberal. She is, of course, still a conservative and still has that element of authoritarianism. Uh, and there's a contradiction here. It's like a kind of set of double standards that capitalists have. So in that case, then, what do they have in common? And what the reason normally I'll, I'll stop here as well and say, our essays on these political ideas are almost always about the internal contradictions between different types of socialists, different types of liberals, different types of uh, conservatives. But in order to show what's distinctive about socialism, we need to show how it's different from liberals and conservatives. And likewise, we might do this with uh, differences between the others as well. So what do they have in common? Well, they both want to preserve order and security. And of course, that's important because they're the people who've got the property and they want to keep the system more or less as it is. They both argue or, or at least present themselves as present the state as acting in the interest of all of society. And one of the things we're going to see with socialists is that they disagree with that. That's not really how the state acts at the moment. Oh. Pass. Uh, hmm. PowerPoint malfunction. Uh, they both seek to protect the rights and property of citizens. And we say that as citizens, as in all citizens, is what capital liberals and conservatives are going to argue. And therefore, the role in the economy should be limited. Citizens should be able to do what they want with their own private, um, private property. And the job of the state is to stop other people stealing your stuff. And either tacitly in the case of conservatism or explicitly in the case of liberalism, citizens give their consent to the government and can withdraw their consent from the government as well. So that's how it presents. That's how liberals and conservatives think about it, a state which looks as though it acts in everybody's interest and which is in some way limited. So what we're going to do is look at the way in which socialists see how the state is. And just like we did with the economy and other things as well, we're looking at this in two ways. What is it like now and what's wrong with it in capitalism? And what could the state be like in future? 
So first, let's look at what it's like in capitalism. It is not actually acting in everybody's interest at all. One of the things that socialists want to argue is that the people who, in a class society, have secured the most important positions in politics and, for that matter, in business and everything else as well, then go about constructing a series of laws which define that acting against them is wrong and criminal uh, and acting in their favour is right and lawful. So we can include all sorts of things in this, like low taxation, or pro-business policies. We think about things like anti-union laws. Anti-union laws are there to protect the interests of employers against the people they're exploiting. Or we can think about health and safety laws, the way in which health and safety laws, uh, we tend to think, uh, when we think about the lack of intervention in the economy, uh, have become a kind of cliche of like, oh, you can't, kids can't play conkers at school because of health and safety or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and that portrayal by the right-wing media, that health and safety is a, is a limit on our freedom, actually, for socialists, is the world turned upside down. Because if we have health and safety laws, they're to protect workers from being overexploited and being made to work in unsafe conditions in order to maximise somebody's profits. And a uh, capitalist state minimises the amount of health and safety legislation it introduces in order to maximise the freedom that capitalists have to exploit people. The state pretends to act in everybody's interests. And here, I guess one of the things we're thinking about is it's often people, most people's barrier to uh, is the state acting in the interests of capitalists. So they say, well, look, if my house gets burgled, I'm going to ring the police. The state turns up and the state records the burglary and the state then tries to go out and catch the, catch the burglar and so on. And putting aside for the fact that that's about property and therefore that's a kind of principle of defending the people, who, especially who've got most property as well. One of the things that um, that we can argue about that is that that action by the state is there merely as a pretense, merely as a kind of what Marxists sort of call a superstructure, which covers up like a kind of big tent or a skin, uh, the real purpose of the system, which is driving the economy in the interests of, of the ruling class. And actually, when we look at the way in which the state uses that power, which it appears to be protecting us all about law and order, it's working class people that it polices most. Uh, it's uh, working class people who end up being the most likely to go to uh, to prison because they're the ones who are most likely to get caught uh, and so on. So there is a, a class bias in, um, in the way in which the state works there. And one more, the state is um, the extent to which people can control the state, the extent to which people can limit the state or make it democratically accountable is actually very limited. And here, what socialists want to do is, is, is point out that the way in which democracy works in a liberal democracy run by capitalists isn't actually as fair or equal as they would want to make out. Uh, that not only do we only get to have elections every five uh, years uh, and have very limited input in between times, but also even the parties we get to choose only have a serious chance of winning elections if they already support pro-business policies and don't uh, fundamentally challenge the interests of the people who are running the system. And when you do get a party which looks as though it might represent that kind of a challenge, then you can see from the Corbyn experiment that the state uh, amasses its ranks in the media and in other business people, spokes, spokespeople, and in the way in which the, the governing parties act. And even within the Labour Party itself, in order to to uh, to undermine that challenge and to prevent it from being successful. Okay, so we know what's wrong with the state in a capitalist society, according to socialists. What would a socialist state look like? So, in a socialist society, one of the things we're going to do, instead of letting the market uh, distribute resources according to the invisible hand, where it uh, simply allows people to seek profit, and by that means then they produce goods of best value and, uh, and fill gaps in the market. One of the problems of that is that it creates massive amounts of uh, overproduction at the same time as leaving lots of people without enough wages to consume lots of things. So we're going to plan the economy. We're going to devise ways in which we can identify what it is that society needs. Uh, we're going to make people work just to, up to that point and no, no more. But we're also not going to have underconsumption. We're not going to have people who are unemployed and starving. We're going to guarantee that when we're producing things, it is to meet the needs of those of all people who require basic necessities of food, housing, but other things as well, transport, culture, all sorts of things. 
To that extent then, rather than leave the market to do it and allow people with private companies in order to compete with each other, necessarily ending in lots of waste and competition and so on, one of the things we're going to do is have uh, key industries, uh, perhaps most industries, run by the state on behalf of the people. You can call this what you like, uh, nationalization. We talked about this a lot last time in the, in the economy lesson, uh, uh, common ownership or whatever it happens to be. But the point here is about exploitation, because while it's in private hands, the incentive is to produce profit. And that profit comes from the surplus labor, the surplus value that workers are creating when they're producing more in the time that they work than they're actually paid for. In this case, then, since the workers are working for uh, an organization which they effectively run and which they will then get its reward from, then they're not going to be exploited, or at least what they produce is going to be reinvested back into society. Now, you could be a Marxist and think this and think that this is kind of one of the ways in which you're going to create a communist society in the end. But you can even be somebody who's a social democrat in the post-war Britain and recognize that key industries, what we used to call the commanding heights, should still be guaranteed as public ownership because that's a way of guaranteeing full employment and ensuring that those, those uh, resources meet, get to people without them costing them too much. Okay, we're also going to make sure that the state provides public services and expanding the state. And if liberals are interested in rolling back the frontiers of the state, that was Thatcher's great uh, slogan, then socialists of whatever stripe are interested in the state doing more and the state using its activity to close the gap between rich and poor. Now, this was the case for new labor under Blair using things like education. The argument was that this was supposed to eradicate inequality, though actually, of course, inequality grew under new labor, but still. And it runs all the way through to what we think of, I suppose, as fundamentalist socialists who want to do this on a gradual basis so that those uh, provision of, of public needs effectively means that uh, there is no big gap between rich and poor and we, we um, bit by bit, uh, create a classless society. So what kind of public services? Well, you know, it could be things like we already produce health, education. I mean, they're quite useful because they meet the needs of capitalism anyway. But let's think about other things as well. Free cinema, free theatre, free culture. Why? Because we want to change people's ways about how they think about society. And instead of competing with each other, then think about uh, being uh, having solidarity and ways of helping each other, and ways of being socially useful. Well, what about, I mentioned before, about free transport and free different types of transport as well. So free public transport, lots of it, uh, because it's environmentally sound. Free e-cars on every street so that people can still have the freedom to go to the beach at the weekend if they want to. Uh, there might be no end to the sorts of things that we think that we could produce collectively for ourselves. And when I say collectively, I mean that the state uh, uh, distributes for people. Um, and that's paid for by the work that people collectively do um, because they know it's going to be socially useful. OK, and lastly, that the state, like the economy, is going to be democratically controlled by the workers. And socialists would you know, draw a distinction here between the kind of false economy, which a uh, false democracy, which applies in a capitalist economy in which workers get a vote every five years and they're politically equal, equal, but economically so unequal that they have no power to uh, political and economic power that comes from directing the, the means of production, directing the things which create the, th the stuff that we need. And that's real power in terms of deciding uh, how much people are going to work all day or how they're going to redistribute the resources so that one street or one town gets some things that it, uh, that it needs. In that case, it's not going to look like necessarily elections, although, of course, there is a big gap here between different types of democratic socialists who do think about the multi-party elections we have in Western liberal democracy, all the way through to revolutionaries who think about a workers' party seizing control of the state through some sort of uh, uh, revolution. OK, so we know What's wrong with the capitalist state? We know how socialists would be different. These are kind of more thinking type questions, I suppose. And I'm not going to try and answer all these now. They're ones for us to, for you to try and um, put some answers to. And when I come to look at your work on Google Classroom and, and make some kind of voice comments on it, I'll see what you've come up with here. Uh, so use these as an opportunity to think for yourselves about how a socialist state might create the business of a socialist society, uh, what some of the problems might be as well, and even what some evidence there might be of 
uh, a socialist society working right now, even though we've got a capitalist society. Okay, that is your uh, fourth core ideas, uh, a little explainer video. If you wanted to know a little bit more about this and think about this uh, more, then this time you can look at the state in capitalist society. It's uh, it's by Ralph Miliband, who was Ed Miliband's dad. And uh, it's a slightly more detailed article, uh, which describes why he thinks that even if we have Labour governments, then they're still likely to create policies which sustain capitalism. Uh, and therefore, what, what the obstacles to creating a socialist society. Okay, um, that'll do for now. Look forward to seeing any questions you've got uh, about this by email.